your decisions. And uh, this is right after Christmas. This is uh, the day after, as a matter of fact. And so it's the 26th. And I want to talk to you today about something out of Genesis 15. And we'll start there, but let's pray first. Father, I ask you, Lord, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we can learn your word together as a family. I give you praise and honor and glory for it, Lord, for our partners that are watching today. And Lord God, for holiness that will reign, that will reign over this program, that will reign in their lives. And the love of God, Lord, will be lived in so that holiness will be lived in. And I give you praise and honor because holiness is beautiful. The beauty of holiness is what was proclaimed ahead of Jehoshaphat. And, Lord, it took care of all the enemies of Israel. Amen. So thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want us to look at Genesis 15 and verse 12. The Scripture declares, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now, the word horror here, is terror, fear, terrible, dread, horror. It's used of idols. It's even, you know, it's used of different words like that. And in Genesis 15, let's go ahead and read 13 now through 16. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety. Now, now this, is, this is what was being explained, what the horror was. The darkness was a mystery. And it concerned Abram's posterity to come. Then God told Abram what it was about, what was hidden in the darkness, what was hidden in the future, what was hidden there. And it says in verse 13 through 16, he begins to tell him what it was and what it is. He said unto Abram, know of a surety. This is a sure thing now. It's not going to be thwarted. This is going to happen that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It wasn't allowed to run its, co uh, its course. Israel, if it wasn't allowed to run its course, Israel would have gotten caught up in the Amorites' prophetic harvest, what they were reaping. And so a prophet saw these things. Look at the thing. And, and when you look at it, just think about it a minute. It was Abram that saw this. Think about the things Daniel saw about those uh, different heads on that beast and all this. Man, this thing makes a, a prophet tremble. It'll make anyone tremble. Look at the things the apostle John saw in the book of Revelation. They saw things that made them fall prostrate on the ground. Things that if not explained to them makes them dread and tremble. It is the future that makes them tremble. This time of year, I think of the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, the, a Christmas, that, that's, that story was one of the, my favorites. How he was visited by three spirits. Well, I realize that, but he was visited. You know, somebody said, oh, it was more than, no, I realize that, but we're concentrating on past, present, and future. How he was visited by the three spirits. But when he saw the last one, the spirit of Christmas is yet to come, he said, I fear you more than any specter I've seen. The future is this way. It is the unknown. A prophet carries within them the future. They constantly talk about the future. They constantly look into the future. They breathe the air of the future. They're nourished by the future. Abraham was surely dreading the darkness he saw. He was surely dreading the darkness he saw before him until God showed him it was his family going into bondage, but that they would come out again 
after 400 years. And God even showed the delay of 30 more years when he said the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. He didn't want them to get caught up in the harvest the Amorites had coming to them. In covenant relationships, which are more bonding than a natural relationship, than natural relationships, each partner of the covenant being, uh, uh, of the covenant that's being made brings their strength to the table. One of the strengths God brings to the table is the strength of the future. God will not make covenant with you without showing you your future. Jeremiah 29, 11 declares, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. One translation says, to give you a future. If this future entails a dreadful thing, God will also show you the deliverance of which he will bring to you and your family to get you out of it. Hallelujah. Now, I want to talk about this horror of darkness. That's what we're speaking of today. This horror of great darkness that Abram saw. It was the future. And he didn't know what it held yet. He didn't know what it was about, but he knew it was a horror, a dread of, of darkness. There's something in the, in the mysterious that he hadn't seen. There was something there. And so the covenant he made and so forth, the Lord began to show him what it was going to be, that his family would come out with great substance and they would come out wealthy and, and that they would not be destroyed and that he would go to his grave in a good old age. And he did. And then he said, how do I know? You know, and he said, set up the covenant. And then these vultures, the birds of prey came down and tried to steal it. He drove them off. It was this horror of great darkness. And he saw his deliverance in the future. Now, you know, God will, in the, in the new covenant that he brought to you and I, he brings your future with you with him to give to you. He already knows the plans he has for you. So in this covenant relationship, he begins to unfold that to you. And some things you'll start looking into the darkness. And why do you think people want a nightlight in their room? They want a, a light. They want something showing some kind of, if it's just a little light from a smoke detector or something, it's a light. It's because the darkness is unknown. It's unknown. You don't know what's there because you can't see it with your natural eye. Well, it's that way in the spirit. And, and there can be a horror of great darkness, this future thing that's coming. You know, a prophet, Samuel, when he came to anoint David as king, Saul's kingdom had already been taken from him by heaven. Now, that's something you should notice. When Saul tore Samuel's robe, tore or his tallit, when he tore his mantle, when he tore that, Samuel looked at him and said, the kingdom now has been rent from you this day and given to a neighbor better than you. That day, Saul lost his kingdom. Well, yeah, but he stayed king for like, I don't know, somewhere between 11 and 14 more years. Yes, he did. But he was not recognized as king. He wasn't recognized as the true king of Israel. Now there was an imposter sitting on the throne. There was someone who was not king who fought with everything he had just to kill the rightful king, wanted to destroy the rightful king that heaven recognized because they couldn't stand it that he didn't have the guts to follow God and do what God told him to do. And so it was taken from him that day. And from that day forward, I want you to notice Saul neglected his borders. He neglected everything in policy. He neglected everything just to go get David. He'd have to be called back. You know, there's a war pending. There's something going on. You better get back. And he'd reluctantly leave off the chase and go back because his whole administration had become one thing driving it. Get rid of God's anointed. 
get rid of who God recognized as the king. Now, that all that ought to sound real familiar to you right now. But anyway, so Samuel says, the Lord says, fill your horn with oil, Samuel, and go anoint one of Jesse's sons. Now, Samuel didn't know which son it was yet, but there was a boy out tending sheep who was a shepherd. He was a, because for a leader to be a leader of a nation, he needs to be a shepherd as well as a warrior. And David was that shepherd. And he would go out there and, and his heart longed for God. His heart longed for God. There's no telling how many stories and, and all that he was raised on that he relived about Samson, about uh, Jephthah, about uh, different judges in the book of Judges, about Joshua, about Moses, about uh, all these people. He probably thought about Abraham. He probably thought about this very story we're talking about right now. And he began to long for God, and he'd write songs, and he was a psalmist, and he'd begin to write prophetic music, and his sound would go up into the heavens and open portals and doors to where he could hear from God and go and see things. And David thought it was so important. You know, I remember one story that uh, they told of the history of, of, of David when he brought the Ark of the Covenant to the tabernacle of David not back to the tabernacle of Moses. You know, that took some nerve to remove the ark and not put it back in the tabernacle of Moses and yet bring it to the, a tabernacle David had made at his house. And David would go in there because David had caught a revelation longing after God's own heart that God wanted a personal relationship. And they, they brought the ark in, and it was on a limestone floor. And they'd set the ark down, and David would carry a scribe in with him. And he'd go in there when the sun would hit the wings on, uh, of the cherubs on the ark, and it would cast a shadow out over that limestone floor, and David would slide up under the shadow and write these psalms. And the scribe would record them, the psalms of David. And he would write it in the shadow of the Almighty the shadow of his wings. So David was a man after God's own heart. He was pursuing such a covenant relationship that no one else had known before since Adam had fallen. And so he, he was going, pursuing a relationship that Abraham had taught about, that Isaac, Jacob, they had all taught about. And Israel was the, was the promised name hidden in Jacob, and it was brought forward. And David was catching hold of this, catching hold of this, and he relived those stories in his imagination, and he killed lions and bears after Samuel poured that oil on him. He had longed after this kind of relationship. And then the Lord said, now fill your horn with oil. Go to Jesse's house and anoint one of his sons that I tell you about. And he said, if Saul hears about this, he'll kill me. Samuel wasn't so much afraid of Saul and Saul's sword. The prophet wasn't afraid of him or he would have never killed Agag in Saul's presence and pointed his finger at the king in front of everybody it would have been something humiliating to Saul. So he wasn't afraid of Saul. He did not want him to kill him before he could pour that oil because the prophet carries the oil for the anointed king. And so he, the Lord said, go up there and tell him you're going to hold a sacrifice and you want to hold it at, at Jesse's house. So when Samuel comes into town, watch this. The scripture says the people trembled. They trembled. Why? Because he carried the future with him. And it was a horror of great darkness that was being brought into town. And so they asked him, is it good? Is it good? Samuel said, it is good. Don't you know the people probably went, Whew. Then he goes to Jesse's house and anoints David. So he carries the future with him. Now, people in governments either love or fear a true prophet. These are people who listen. Uh, they're people who listen to this program, this one right here, from both camps. 
There are those who listen to this program to hear the word of the Lord because they want to gain revelation in their future. There are those who listen to this program and government to do the same. Then there are those officials who listen to this program just to try and catch someone in their words. To try to destroy them because deep down they fear them. They tremble. A horror of great darkness. And they don't know the future. What makes everyone respond to a prophet? It is because they bring the horror of great darkness, the unknown of a future time. I wrote a book that was, uh, that's out now, and, and I wrote this book, and it was dealing with all prophetic situations, written in like a fictitious story. And do you know there were people that were um, fortune tellers, and there was one that wrote the ministry wanting that book, not because they wanted so much I think to be delivered, they wanted that book for the information in it. So they wanted to something, a copy of it, so they could learn for their own good, but to learn to use it for their own good. Governments listen to prophets because of this. A prophet is an officer of the court of heaven. Now, I'm reminded every time I say that, of David and Nathan. When David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed by putting him on the front lines and having the troops draw back from him. And it was worse than that. David had gotten Uriah's wife pregnant and tried to cover up the pregnancy by calling Uriah in, getting him to go home and sleep with his wife. But the man was so honorable, he said, can I go home and do that when the rest of the Lord's army is out there on the ground sleeping in tents? He said, I can't do that. And so then he called Uriah in, got him drunk. He said, go home to your wife. He wanted him to make him think it was his child. But Uriah slept on the steps and wouldn't go. So David wrote out his death warrant and sealed it, and he knew he was honorable enough not to open it. So Uriah carried his own death warrant back to Joab and probably handed it to Joab and was smiling. And Joab probably read it and then looked up at him and maybe forced a smile and nodded his head <clears throat> dismissed him. He thought he had done an honorable mission for the king. And yet the, the, the writing said, get him against the wall where the heaviest fighting is and then pull back from him and leave him alone so that he'll be killed. And he was killed. And then he, it looked like David was doing a noble, honorable thing by going and getting his, his widow, bringing her to the palace and marrying her. I mean, that's, the king is going to take care of the man's wife. But Nathan heard from the Lord and went in there. Because when a king sins, now, now listen to what I'm telling you. This monarchy uh, of a king, David was the final say. And when a king or, or a leader, a president or somebody, that when they sin or when government becomes so corrupt, the people moan and cry for help. They cry for deliverance. And they reach out and they cry out to God for deliverance because they can cry no higher. If you've appealed to the government, they just, they just uh, shoot you down, so to speak. And some of them literally do. If they appeal to the president, say he's doing wrong, you know, like Joe Biden said, he said, I don't care if you think I'm Satan incarnate. Well, this shows you how high it goes. And when the government cannot be appealed to, then the people appeal to heaven. And heaven sends an officer of the court. And when the officer of the court of heaven comes into the earth, he brings the court of God into the earth, the court of the Lord. And then this is what Nathan did. He brought in the court of Jehovah into the realm of David. And he told David the story. He said, there was a rich man in your kingdom. He had a lot of flocks, a lot of sheep. He said, and there was a poor man in your kingdom. 
He had one little ewe lamb, and, and she ate at his table like one of his children. And when the rich man had guests come, instead of killing and butchering one of his own sheep to feed them, he went and took the poor man's little ewe lamb and butchered it. Oh, David was furious. He was furious. I guess he was being a shepherd. And he stood up and said, the man will die. He'll repay fourfold. He'll do this. He'll do that. Who is the man? And Nathan, an officer of the court of the Most High, said, thou art the man. So God had brought the case before the king. The king pronounced his own judgment. And then God offered. David thought he would surely die. And he went and appealed to mercy and appealed to God in covenant. And the Lord spared him. The child died, but the Lord spared him. But even David said about the child, said, he'll go wherever, where he's going. I can go see him one day. It shows you where all the little babies go, don't it? Even those conceived in sin, still they belong to the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, so because of this, a prophet is an officer of the court of heaven. Now, they bring the court of heaven into the earth in order for God to try kings, presidents, and such. Now, I want you to listen to this. I'm going to try to tell you something uh, out of, you can hear it if I can say it. I just have to say it right. Proverbs 11 and verse 1. It declares this, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, all capitals, Lord. That's God in his system of government. It's a false balance. It says uh, is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is the Lord's delight. Now, okay, right now, with the Ukraine and Israel being on the scene at the same time, one was a false balance and the Israel, the true balance. The point being that Jehovah God is in the earth right now trying nations, kingdoms, and kings, and presidents. Remember what happened to the official in Turkey not long ago who came out against Israel. See, let's, let's look at something here. I thought I was going to save it till last, but, but let's... Let's look at this in Isaiah 40. I want you to see this. This is when God was making the earth, creating the heavens, creating the earth, and so forth. Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye, com listen now close, comfortably, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. He wants you to speak comfortably, comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned for she hath received of the Lord's hands hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. This was the story of John the Baptist, who was a prophet. He was the one who fulfilled this. He was the direct prophet this was speaking of. But it also shows the spirit of the prophets and the cry of all prophets. Prophets cry the loudest when the balancing scales are brought into the earth. Prophets cry the loudest when the balancing scales are brought in on the scene. Now let's finish this. Listen to this. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Remember the Lord, all capitals, is God in his system of government, in his balancing scales. The voice said cry and he said, what shall I cry? Now pay close attention. All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
O Zion that bringeth, bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Watch this close now. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and hath meted out heaven with a span. Talking about this, a nine inch span. And comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. Watch. And weighed the mountains in scales. And the hills in a balance. Now he's speaking of these scales. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or who being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment? The scales. And taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Watch this close in verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust in the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Take heed, officials, the scales are in the earth right now. Every decision you make concerning God's people Take heed, you are pronouncing your own judgment. The balance of the scales has been brought into the earth. The Ukraine was a false balance. They were created and invented so that a wicked regimes around the earth could weigh the nations by their own false scales. However the nations treated Ukraine, they were judged by it. They were judged People would say, why aren't you condemning Russia? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you? They're weighing the nations by the false balance of the Ukraine. A farce war created to weigh nations with one ultimate end, an abomination. All abominations stem from the abomination of desolation that will stand in the holy place one day, the Antichrist. So the false balance, which was an abomination, weighing all the nations in it was to bring in the abomination that would sit in the holy place. And when Israel wouldn't condemn Russia, the actor that was placed over Ukraine said, why aren't you condemning Russia? And he came against Israel. When he spoke against Israel, all at once, Hamas, it wasn't long, Hamas attacked Israel. And a war there, a great battle broke out in the, in the Gaza, and all of it began to happen. And when it did, now suddenly the Ukraine scales were just knocked over. And the scales, the real scales that Isaiah 40 talks about, it says it's Israel. You speak to them comfortably, he said. You better speak to them very comfortably to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is accomplished. He was speaking of this, that her warfare is accomplished when false balances are brought on the scale. The real balance comes on the scale, and usually Israel's at war. And when they go to war, every nation is weighed by their support for them. He said, you pray that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then the voice of the prophets start crying. Because now the scales, the real ones are on the scene. The Ukraine was just kind of forgotten. Couldn't even get the support. And suddenly the nations are crowding into Israel and around it in the Mediterranean and so forth. Here they come, and everyone that suddenly speaks against Israel in colleges are losing their jobs. Nations are condemned or are, are, are exonerated by their support of what's going on right now. 
in Israel. The real balance is on the, screen, on the scene. The, the, the point I'm trying to make today is this. When you saw that start, the scales of justice of the Lord's judgment has come into the earth. And the prophets are crying, get it right, get it right, get it right. Why? Because you are now being, the nations are being put in the, in the buckets and vanity is being weighed. Everything's being weighed in the scales. Oh, I, I hope anybody can see this. It's not just me today. They're in the scales weighing the nations. But it says the people are like the grass in the earth. Prophets come into the earth and start proclaiming. They bring the court of Jehovah into the earth and it weighs kings, presidents, officials. It makes no difference who they are. Beware and take heed. Take heed how you do because we're not the ones on trial. God's people are not the ones on trial. Donald Trump is not the one on trial. The courts... The, the kings, the presidents, the officials, everybody's being weighed right now. Your nations and people are in those buckets. You're being weighed right now. How you're treating God's people right now. How you're treating his anointed like Trump. How you're treating different people. How you treat Netanyahu. What you're doing in the, in you, everything you're passing judgment on. And those of you that are all the way down to cities, States and cities, take heed. You are on trial. Heaven is trying you. And why do you propose to be bigger than God? He's brought his scales into the earth. It was very plain when that happened in Israel. But see, nobody would really looks at it because you have to believe the prophets and you prosper. And then prophets were spotlighted everywhere. And those mocked the prophets. People come against the prophets. People do this to the prophets. And they're, they're abusing the court of heaven. It's like in the book of Matthew. When, when the Lord left... We talked about this, I think, last week, and I thought I was going to continue on last week, but the Lord gave me this for this morning. It's when the, the, the Lord of a vineyard left and, and led his vineyard out to husbandmen. Jesus was talking. He was talking to the religious leaders, and he told them this parable. He said, the Lord of the vineyard led his vineyard out to the husbandmen. And said, and they were supposed to give him his due when he sent for it. The fruit. It should have bore fruit. And so the, the, the Lord of the vineyard, the Bible said, Jesus said he sent his servants to collect his share. And when his servants got there, he said they beat some of them. They beat them. And then some they beat and some they killed. He was talking about the prophets. They kept coming, kept coming to the leaders of Israel. And some they killed, some they beat, some they killed. And then finally the Lord of the vineyard said, I know I'll send my son. They'll reverence him. And so the son arrived. But here's what the wicked men said. Look, it's the heir. Come, let us kill him. And will seize on his inheritance. Take heed, says the Lord. And in case some of you didn't hear, that was a message in tongues that came from Austin. Take heed, says the Lord. 
For as I meted out heaven with a span, and the nations were as drops of buckets in the buckets of the scales, I am meting out judgment with a span. Through the nations my hand has come. And nations are being weighed in this balance. And you are being weighed in this balance. If you come against God's people. And you come against my inheritance. To seize my inheritance. For I promised Moses my glory would fill this earth. And you will not stop it, says the Lord. For you are in the buckets and the people are as grass in there. For I am weighing the earth now. So I'm weighing your arrogance. Let your arrogance climb to its highest peak and watch what happens to you next. For heaven will take care of you. Heaven will see to you. For the cord of heaven is in the earth. It is up to you how heaven judges you. Faithful, merciful, graceful, or vindictive. Do not be one who plots the theft of my inheritance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good is the word of the Lord. We esteem the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I want to look at 1 Kings chapter 13 as we close this message today. Yes, I will, Lord. 1 Kings 13, verse 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. This is Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin by creating false idols, a, a calf that they could worship and called it Jehovah, so they wouldn't go to Jerusalem. And he cried again, he made them sin. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. This is God in his justice. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Isn't that amazing that that young prophet even called his name? Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places. Said the priest of the high places will be offered on this very altar that you have erected for this. That burn incense upon thee and the men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day saying, this is the sign which the Lord, all capitals, hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the sayings of the man of God, which had cried against the altar of Bethel, in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Now remember, this prophet had brought the court of the Lord into his presence and told him what was going to happen. And Jeroboam is about to pass his own judgment. He stretched forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. In other words, grab that prophet. And when he did, his hand dried up so that he could not pull it again to himself. The altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. Do you see that? It's the same thing that happened with David. The king had enough sense to cry for mercy, and his hand was restored. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. He wants to pay the prophet now. And the man of God said unto the king, If you will give me, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou comest. So he went another way, and he returned not by that way that he came to Bethel. Take heed, officials. 
Jeroboam, like David, pronounced his own judgment when a prophet called him out. The court of Jehovah has come into his presence to try him. His hand withered, but he had enough sense to repent. And the prophet prayed for him, and he was restored. If this keeps going, and officials do not turn and repent for what they are doing to destroy the covenant God made with our founding fathers and God's own people, heaven has heard and mercy is being offered. But remember, the scales are in the earth. So take heed. While I was looking at all of this, I began to think about, and it's, it's like it came to me then, the Lord brought this to me, that all the witches and all of you that are casting spells against prophets and God's people trying to disrupt these things in the earth, you have just been pushed in the balance. You've been placed in the balance. And I can assure you one thing, demons will not deliver you from the weight in that scale. You will pronounce your own harvest. No one has to hurt anyone. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, all capitals. The scales are in the earth. Why do you keep going? Why do you? Keep trying to attack God's people. Why don't you officials do what's right? Why do you think God is not living in the heavens? Why do you think that you can go eat, drink, and be merry at home while you oppress the innocent? Why do you think that's going to last? Heaven has heard. And when Israel did what it did, the scales were brought into the scene. And unlike what you see in these statues of blind justice, what they're trying to portray is that the scales of justice and law cannot be swayed by those being tried. But in the other way, it cannot be influenced by the clamor of the people. But I assure you, these scales are not blind. There's a weight already placed in it when God laid the foundations of the earth. It's called equity. And it justly weighs everyone. Don't you remember Belshazzar? Daniel read the writing, many, many tikel you farsum. He said, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. He was talking about these scales. And they're in the earth now. God help the officials. From federal, state, county, city. God help them make the right decisions. God's mercy is also upon the scene. And he is really God. And some of you, people don't see how he could love you. <laughs> and maybe we don't. But he's offering mercy. Hallelujah. After that young prophet spoke to Jeroboam, and that happened, the king didn't force the prophet to come back to his castle, to his palace. The prophet said, I can if you offered me half your kingdom. But it made the religious world mad that a prophet had such power in his words. And on his way home, there was an old prophet that sent word to the young prophet and lied to him. Now, this is religion. Notice it's dealing with government and religion. And he sent word to him and said, come to my house and eat. He said, I can't come to your house. The Lord told me don't stop anywhere. He said, but I'm a prophet too. I'm a prophet too. And an angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, have you come by? And he came by because religion, who represented God, deceived him. 
because he wanted that prophet. And when that young prophet sat down, they were probably laughing and talking and eating until the old prophet looked at him and said, because you didn't obey the word of the Lord. But the scripture plainly said that prophet lied to him. Because you didn't obey the word of the Lord, he trapped him in his own prophecy. Trapped him in his own prophecy, and that's what's in the earth now. Now that the scales are out and kings are being weighed, now religion is trying to suck the prophets in and cut their hair. Trying to suck the prophets in and trap them within their own words because they can't control them. Because they're jealous and want the prophet's words to be their words. I'm a prophet too. You were a lying prophet. You lied to that young man and he got him killed. And then tried to make up for it because the, the one who said I'm a prophet too. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If he ever was. I'm a prophet too. He wasn't prophesying anything to that man. He used the man's prophecy. The Lord had told the young prophet, if you go home another way, don't do it. Then suddenly he says, I'm a prophet too. And because you didn't obey the word of the Lord, even though he lied to him, he said, a lion will kill you in the way. And a lion killed him. But he didn't tear the carcass up. And the lion just sat down. I imagine he stared straight ahead. And when the old prophet heard it, he sent to get him. And there was the lion sitting there and the donkey standing unharmed. And the young prophet dead. He said, bury him in my sepulcher with me. Well, that don't make you holy. That don't make you holy because you're trying to get his bones on your bones. That's exactly right, Robin. Robin said that anointing won't hold. He was trying to get that young prophet's bones to resurrect him. It won't work. You can't be a partaker of that anointing. You're a liar. You lied and killed a prophet. Now that's what's going on. So prophets take heed. Don't let anyone trap you in your own prophecy. And then put a demonic prophecy as your harvest. Don't let anything, don't, don't let a lying spirit of someone who says, I'm a prophet too. That young man had real authority. The whole king hand withered the altar burst open and the ashes poured out right in front of this young man and the king didn't try to hurt him either he said come home with me come on home with me he said I can't but the king didn't force him so religion lied to him hell had set forth to get him killed that day because hell don't like prophets, it's, they scare them. They scare hell. They scare them. They scare all the demonic forces. Hallelujah, is anybody with me today? So these things are in a time we're in of the balancing of the scales. Now I've told you what governments are being weighed by heaven and how it's happening. Look at the leader, in, look at one of the leaders in Turkey. You don't do that. But now you know what's coming against the prophets. It's religion and jealousy from the camp, all the streams together, the camp of God's people. Yeah, we don't believe in prophets. Send a word, say, I'm a prophet too. I'm a prophet too. And the Lord said this, an angel appeared to me. I don't care if 50,000 of them appeared to you singing a hallelujah chorus. Once you hear the word of the Lord and you got this right here in your hand, I'm not obeying an angel. I'm an officer of the court. I stand before God for what I say. 
And I'm not signing you damned petitions to be accountable to a man for what thus saith the Lord. As long as thus saith the Lord is based on this, who are you to try to stop it? Oh, Brother Robin, you're, you're just heavy. You just talk. You talk heavy. You t you're talking, oh, oh, you just, oh, you hurt my little feelings. If you're, if you're a leader in the body of Christ, you should already be living beyond your feelings. You should be up above your feelings. And you should be living on this, the written word. Everything is based on this. And I'm telling you, Paul said it this way. If, if, if me, uh, uh, or he said, if, if anyone or an angel of light appear to you, or an angel appear and say something contrary, Paul said, to what I've taught you, he said, let him go to hell. I'm not taking the word. You, an angel is subordinate to the heir of God speaking the word. They hearken to the voice of his word. I'm not listening to an angel over thus saith the Lord based on the written word. Do you understand that? Dear God, what do you have a platform for? What do you have a platform for if you're not going to speak victory and encouragement to the people and have the nerve to point at governments and have the nerve to say, and if you're not doing that, don't stand up and, and start condemning those who are. God, optimize your platform. Use it. Dear God, we, we need all we can get. We need people that had that fire burning in them. What happened to it? What happened to your fire that kindled up in you, that burned and blazed out your eyes? What happened to you that when somebody poked you, you spoke scripture at them? What happened to you? Where did you go? There's nothing wrong with having mega churches. Thank God for big churches. But dear God, don't lose the fire that built it. Instill it into those thousands and thousands of people so that they can be full of fire and, and zeal for the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yelo poto korishe helmando ride. Ramba angongangangalizi shukupai. Veto, veto. Biko suka je zingundambando kole porkishele vratole brendo gongangole azi zaka zeperto voto vshise rambrondo estu pa kora sele pratike ale vrindi ayando ko oy ayin dibiliata veso kushya de bangro for my system of seed time and harvest was an instrument I given to man to benefit them. And I know when people speak with malice in their heart. And I judge these things, says the Lord. For vengeance is mine. For I know the true intent of the heart. For you think you can look at God and mock the living Lord. In his system. For no says the Lord. For vengeance is mine. And it will go the way I say it will go. Not man. For this is already in motion. For the scales are in the earth. Then again I say unto you. Again I say unto you. And again I say unto you. Covenant words. That will speed this up. And it's coming fast upon you. So hear the word of the Lord. And make your yea, yea, and your nay, nay, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good is the word of the Lord. We esteem the word of the Lord. Did you hear that? He said, again, I say unto you three times, he said it. Again, again, again. 
This thing is happening now. And right before, I, I, could, I could hear that, the, the, that it's tipping over the edge. And he's making a pull and a plea for his, for his people. Governments are in the bucket. But his people, his people, don't be those that help kill the prophets. Don't be one of those. Don't be one of those. Because the prophecies didn't happen the way you thought they happened. Because you were looking through natural eyes instead of spiritual eyes. Saul stopped being king that day. That day. And hell unleashed an onslaught to keep the rightful one from coming. How is that hard to understand? How is that hard to see? How? We must start developing spiritual eyes again. Because in this thing, Pan, oh, not Pan, Robin said, Dan said, I shouldn't say Pan. <laughs> we laughed about it. But when this thing shakes out, you're going to see how everything was true at one time. Someone asked me back before the, the elections of 2020, they said, do you think Donald Trump will win the presidency? They asked me on the phone. I said, yes. Whether anybody knows it or not, I said, I'm not sure. Well, that's exactly how it played out, isn't it? Think about that. So let's get our spiritual ears and eyes on and start looking at, if you're talking about prophecy, you're talking about spiritual matters. I mean, really? Don't you know when Isaiah said the virgin will conceive and the government will be on his shoulder and this and that and the other, don't you know everybody said, man, that's going to come to pass next week. But when a prophecy comes forth, all the hell unleashes everything it has to keep it from it. And it's obvious that the, the heirs of David was, was trying to be killed to keep the Messiah out of the earth till it came down to one little boy. If he'd have died, the line was cut off. Well, that don't negate Isaiah's prophecy. Why do you want to interchange prophecy and interchange the high spiritual matters and, and weave it into flesh? The word became flesh. That's the way it works. That means, and it says in that, talking about Jesus, and the word became, he's talking about the prophetic word that was from Genesis 3.15 all the way through by every prophet. And then Micah said where he's going to be born, in Bethlehem. This is going to happen. This is going, I mean, it just came down to the smallest detail. And in the fullness of time, the scripture said, God sent his son, or and the word became flesh. And dwelt among men. It wasn't weaved in flesh. It became flesh. And it was spiritual decisions that changed Rahab the harlot. It was spiritual decisions. The scripture talks about her being a harlot. We don't need to paint out what that is. What that looks like in the city of Jericho. But when she chose when she chose Israel's God, something changed in her whole DNA. The word became flesh. And so that's what's happening. And the scripture said when the word became flesh, it said light. It was light shining into the darkness and a war took place in St. John 1. A war took place. It was a war in St. John 1. Listen to it. It says in the beginning, the word was with God 
and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And there was a war over it. And the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness comprehended it not. It means it couldn't grab it, hold it down, and seize on it. It was overpowered. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It was true all the time, even though it didn't look like it to the world. It was still true. They killed the prophets. They killed some. They beat some. History said they sought Isaiah in half. He was too dangerous to the kingdom. Whether they did or not, that's what history tells us. He killed different ones. Warrior prophets came on the scene like Elijah and Elisha. Suddenly they were on the scene. Jeremiah and all these, all of them from beginning to the end was governmental prophets. They dealt with governments. They dealt with the prophetic word of the horror of darkness of the future. But the word wasn't weaved into to sinful flesh. Well, you know, the word just, I can live like I want, and the, the word will just, and, and you know, if, if I can't make it come to pass, then certainly God can't. The word is not weaved into flesh. The word becomes flesh. Hallelujah. And we are at crunch time in the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, that's, that's, I think that should be plenty today. We could meditate on, we could talk about, we could, we could think on, we could, you know, make religion so mad they just quiver all over. We could, we could make governments stare with their eyes like this, not knowing what's coming. Why, do you know what's coming, Brother Robin? Victory. Victory according to the word of God. It's not mine to bring to pass. It's not yours to bring to pass. It's ours to speak it, speak it, speak it. Uh, put his word in our heart. Speak it out of our mouth. Start, start speaking it, speaking it. And the, the, the throes of darkness cannot overcome that light. There's been a void created. That started back in 08 with Obama. The void began to be dark, dark, dark. But now there's light, light, light being spoken into it. And the light will prevail. Hallelujah. Come on, Robin, you want to receive the offering today? And it's a, it's a great privilege to have you. Praise God. Well, I am privileged to get to receive the offering. And uh, I, it... I was just said today's been a it's been a very prophetic day and it's I mean this is the 11th hour so but it's been like a culmination today and I believe it's because it's the the last 11th hour of 2023 and the Lord drew my eyes to the clock while I was sitting over there and he and I heard this in my spirit and he said, how long will the clock be at 11? He said, because there'll come a day that the clock will strike 12. And so this is very, uh, you know, just when you think things may be kind of, you know, you, you may be never get used to the prophetic or the supernatural. Never get used to and just say, oh, well, you know, it, it's just another 11th hour. No, these are the times that you need a prophetic voice coming out more so than ever. Never. You know, I operate in the prophetic. Uh, I have, you know, but I, I don't call myself a prophet. I'm a pastor, and I, but I, I operate in the prophetic, 
and always has it, ever since I was, uh, you know, the Lord would come to me in dreams and, and, and uh, things like that and speak to me as a child also. But I know the office that I stand in, but I, I, I respect the office of the prophetic and I, I esteem the word of the Lord, and we we need to not just take it. Oh well, they're just it's just a prophet, and it's not something that you that you just automatically call yourself. You know, just like I said Sunday, being a pastor, I was excited because in the scripture where it said that the the angels came to the shepherds with, to tell of the birth of Jesus. I said, well, there's not a booth to go sign up as a pastor or one to sign up as a prophet. It is a mantle that the Lord gives you. And so uh, never take the office of a prophet lightly. And um, so today we're going to, or a pastor or any of the fivefold ministry, we're going to receive our offering today, and Krista usually does this, but I'm very privileged to uh, to receive the offering today, the 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 eleventh hour of 2023. We're about to step in through the open door of 2024, and so in Philippians four and seventeen, um, Paul is talking. And he says uh, to the Philippians, and he said, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And there is an account that you have. You know, everybody talks about, uh, you know, my account, my account, my account. There is an account when you give. To, um, um, he was there was he was talking about his ministry that you give to a ministry that you can draw from. He said, "I want you to have fruit in that account. I want that account to flourish." You know, I am. I'm just going to tell you something. I am a giver, and those who knows me knows, and I want to be known as a professional giver, <laughs> if there is a, such thing. I, I want to be known as, you know what, that I want to outgive. I want to bless. You say you want to do that to so you can have bra bragging rights? No, I want to have fruit in my account where I can be able to Keep blessing and keep giving and and always and never need, abounding so much that I'm able to give unto every good work, and that's the word. Amen. But listen, at verse eighteen says, "But I still let me. We got to get some lights here. <laughs> but I have all and abound." And I am full, having received of Ephroditus the things which were sent from you. And an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It does. And he said, my God shall supply. It's not a, um, it's not a might. It's not he, he's thinking about doing. Shall is the strongest word in the English language. He, it's going to happen. It's just, it's just when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen. And I want you to notice this right here. He said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory 
by Christ Jesus. His riches, not your riches, not your neighbor's riches, not the First Baptist riches, not the Pentecostal riches, not the Methodist riches, but it is his riches in glory. Well, glory is, it, when the glory comes, it is a manifested presence. The, in the glory, things manifest. And he, he didn't say, if he had said, I'm going, he's going to give it to you here on earth, but it is, it's according to his riches in the glory. And when the glory comes on the scene, these manifested riches come to you. Amen. That's, that's, that brings it, when the glory comes down, it comes into our uh, atmosphere, our timeline, and he, and the glory comes down. But he said, "I want you when you give to know that it, the fruit. It's not because of me or not because of this ministry. It is because you're going to have fruit abound to your account. So therefore, my God's going to supply all your need according to His riches." In the glory yeah. by the anointed one, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 So today, take hold of that. Get, get, let that become rhema within you. Let that become so much a part of you knowing it's not anything that you have to do, that you, that you uh, have to pull from. If he had said, it, it's going to come in the earth. But see, it put it in the, the manifested realm of the glory. But it's according to his riches. Not according to your riches or according to my riches. It's ac according to his riches. And then the glory is going to manifest it. Anything that has to do with life will manifest in that. It doesn't just have to be that right. It's not don't have to be money. It doesn't have to be it, anything. It's going to manifest itself in the glory. And a lot of people, you know, they'll they'll say, "Oh, the glory! Oh, the glory! Oh, the glory!" You need to be praying that the glory shows up. It is here. It changes everything. Everything. Today has been such a prophetic day. We've just been. It's been bouncing off of every one of us. You can't help it today. It's just, it's pulling it out. And it's been an awesome day. So today, when you give today, I want you to just hold that seed up. And I want you, and the, the ways to give will be on the screen. Um, uh, text to give, what, however it is. Y'all y'all know, y'all just look and, and read. I don't know how to. I don't know all the numbers or, or anything that, that yeah, I'm sure they've got it on. But I tell you what, it's been a year of, of a, um, it's been a fight in 23. And it has been, but we have stood every Tuesday. We've come in and I feel like that, that this, as we're winding down in 23, I, I hear, I hear the Lord say faithful today. I hear him say faithful. You've been faithful. The 11th hour team's been faithful. The 11th hour family's been faithful. You've been found faithful. You've stood. You've stood. Patriots of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Patriots of the kingdom. And I tell you what, 24, you're going to see rewards come like never before. I hear the Lord say. 24 is going to come rushing through your door. And it will come rushing through and on to you so fast that you will laugh, you will dance, and you will shout. Stand firm, says the Lord, for great 
is your reward in 24. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whew, I, wasn't, I wasn't asking for it, but I sure am glad it came. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Let's just thank him today. Thank him today. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, for you are great and greatly to be praised. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Will we pray over you today as you give? As you give, we pray it is given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Do you believe that? Take it. The word receive means just to take it. Just reach out and take it. Have you ever seen a little baby that you, maybe you've got two cookies and you're planning on giving them one, but you're holding it, and, man, they'll just reach out and grab it. Amber was telling me about this. They all went skating roller skating uh, a bunch of them the other night and they ordered a pizza and this four-year-old little boy he just walked right up and just just they they didn't know him <laughs> he was just there at the skating rink four years old just went over there grabbed him a, a piece of pizza and everybody was just looking and nobody and amber said well we can order another pizza but that little feller he just walked up he thought that was his pizza he's supposed to do that well, that was all. He, he didn't ask no questions. That pizza was right there. He just went up and took him a, a piece of it. Hallelujah. Well, as children of God, we need to just walk up when the family's there and just take us a piece of pizza. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Roxanne, come on. I tell you what, the preacher's on me. I, I, come on. And just tell what, what, what good has been happening with our, our precious partner. Yes, we've got some, some good stuff that's been happening towards the end of the year. Uh, this one says uh, she actually wrote out different things the Lord has done for their family during this year, their victory reports. So listen to these. Uh, they said it, tithing, the first thing they said was tithing is of the Lord and, and offering in good ground also works. So. Yes, well, we'll do that. So it said this year they paid off two cars in the same month, paid off two cars. And they said they were able to come to the church and visit twice this year in August and October. And they said, wow, to have time to do that was a blessing. They also said they had um, gotten hurt on the job in March, but God had been so faithful and took care of them through their finances through that time. And also, they said this month they checked their credit score for the first time in two years because their credit had tanked a couple of years before due to loss of both of their jobs simultaneously. And they said, whose credit score goes from 500 to over 700 in less than two years? So praise God for restoration financially. But they said that they were now able to financially buy a home and move to Alabama and not have to worry about paying rent the first quarter in 2024 as they exit their job. So praise God for all the victory the Lord has done in their life uh, this year. And this one says, um, there was another lady that had wrote in, I had read it earlier, that said um, she had uh, broken her ankle a um, couple of years ago and had went through uh, different things in physical therapy said it didn't really bother her to walk around but she had pain from time to time it's just kind of aggravating and so she's a faithful partner of the church watches online and she said that one day she was out walking and decided she just wanted to run she hadn't run in a number of years and she just took off running and said that now she has no pain in her ankle whatsoever she had wrote in and asked us to pray for her our prayer minister prayed over her she took off running in 2023 and her ankle was healed so thank you Lord for healing this the people this year we've had so many praise reports come through this year for miraculous healings people being healed of cancer from chronic diseases from broken bones from people who've broken their pinky toes have wrote in and said they were healed so we praise the Lord for that 
I charge you today to take inventory over 2023. Look back this past year and write down every victory that the Lord has given you this year and rehearse that. And before the year's over, take that piece of paper and read them off and make sure that all the spirit world can hear it, that the devil can hear it of what God has done in your life this year. So praise the Lord. Send in your victory reports this new year so that we can read them to our 11th hour family so that we can rejoice with you for what God is doing in your life. And we speak bigger victories, more victories in 2024. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I was thinking too um, that that... um, that door in 24 that you were talking about, Robin, I thought you were going to say it, so I wasn't going to say anything. That, but I heard standing over there, and said, listen for the roar coming out of 24. There's a, the line of Judah's on the other side of that door calling you through the door. And he's wanting to match roars. He, he listens for himself. He, he likes to hear himself talk. And, and because he can agree with what he says. There's a roar coming through that door in 24. You ought to go through it with a roar coming out of you, headed toward 24 with a roar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And man, things are, things are, are getting better. They're heating up, but they're getting better. Hallelujah. Sometimes it looks like you may be going down, but you're really going up. Amen. That's the way it is. And, um, you know, I want to say this one thing before we close today uh, to, to the partners and to believers in general that's watching. It's time. You must this year get some. some root in you this year. Amen. And we're going to go forward. Now the next 11th hour will be in 24. And of course in the spirit, we've already been in 24 for over three months, but now the world is about to catch up to 24 and we already have declared what's going to happen going through the door. And so next Tuesday, the next 11th hour will be a brand new roar in 24. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if you don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life and you're tuning in today and you say, man, all this sounds really good, but I I don't know that I'm even born again. Well, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You need to do what the apostle Paul said, believe in your heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you'll be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You want to do that and do it today. Don't go another day without Jesus as Lord of your life. Hallelujah. So why don't you just pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. Now, come in my heart, Lord, and cleanse me of all unrighteousness and put my foot on a brand new step. Forgive me of all sin, and I'm going forward with you from now on. Take my life. Do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that are born again, and maybe you just got born again, or you've uh, you've been born again for 40 years, but you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells you what to say. 
So why don't you do that today? Go ahead and start off this today and go through the door in 24 with a loud roar. Hallelujah. Just say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the mighty Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. And now just start thanking Him for it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then whatever. <music>